All right, guys, in this tutorial, we're going to be talking about specific heat capacity, exothermic, and endothermic processes. So before we actually get to the specific heat capacity, let's talk about the heat and the temperature. So a lot of time, students actually take the temperature and the heat to be the same thing, but they are actually not the same quantities. They are rather different quantities. The heat is actually a form of energy and uh, you may recall other form of energies are like kinetic energy, potential energy, chemical energies, and sound. They are all different form of energies. And uh, the total energy of the universe is actually conserved or constant, and uh, that's given by the, the, the laws of conservation of energy. What that really means, the energy is never created or destroyed. It just changes from one form to another form. So we can have the kinetic energy changing to the potential energy and vice versa. And we can also have a chemical energy changing to the heat and vice versa. So it changes from one form to another, but you really don't lose it or gain it. And on the other hand, the temperature is actually a fundamental quantity. Energy is not in a fundamental quantity, it's in a derived quantity. Temperature is in a fundamental quantity and uh, uh, the units for uh, the temperature, for the most part, it's gonna be the degrees Celsius or the Kelvin. And obviously we do use the degrees Fahrenheit, but degrees Fahrenheit are not used in any sort of calculations. The SI unit is going to be the Kelvin and the Celsius there. Okay. Let's talk about how the energy and the temperature is kind of related to one another. So there's, there are actually going to be two processes. One of them is called an uh, exothermic process. So in an exothermic process, the energy or the heat is released. So whenever you perform a process where energy is released, it's an exothermic process. And the exothermic process usually rise up the temperature of the surroundings, or another way of saying the temperature would increase of the surroundings anytime you have the exothermic processes process being taken place. And I'll take an example in a bit. On the other hand, the endothermic process actually requires energy or it requires heat. All right, so the energy is required and that energy is coming from the surroundings. And uh, in, in those cases, the temperature of the surrounding usually decreases. Okay. So let's take an example where we can actually relate the energy and the temperature with one another. Uh, suppose we got these two mixtures. Uh, I have two beakers here containing uh, two reacting mixtures, A and B, and assume both of them are at thermal equilibrium, means uh, initially they both at room temperature, or we can say 22 degrees Celsius or 295 Kelvin as being the room temperature here. So when I mix those two together, so I'm going to have either A kind of poured into B, all right, so we, the resulting solution is going to be the mixture of A and B. So a couple of things that can happen. So when we mix up A and B, and they, they can react with one another, supposing they are made to be reacting with one another uh, as they are the reacting species. So when they do react with the, one another, the temperature of the resulting solution, so initially suppose the temperature was 22 degrees Celsius for both A and B. Now the temperature of the resulting solution could increase, could decrease, or could stay the same. Okay. So based on that, you can predict if the reaction between A and B was exothermic, endothermic, or neither of them, okay? So suppose if the temperature increased, and suppose the temperature went all the way to 33 degrees Celsius, just hypothetical number there, uh, what that really did after the reaction of A and B, the energy was released, all right? So the energy in this particular case was released and that energy was actually used to warm up the surrounding environment and in this particular case was the 
uh, the liquid here, which most likely could be the water or some other liquids or some other solvents there. But that uh, energy was released and it warmed up the surrounding environment and that makes it an exothermic reaction. So keep in mind when you mix up two solutions with one another and if the energy or and if the temperature goes up means the energy is released and it's an exothermic process. On the other hand, if after mixing those A and B, the temperature decreases, suppose the temperature went all the way to 15 degrees Celsius, in this particular case, the reaction of A and B required some energy. Okay, so the energy would be required. And where that energy is going to be coming from? Well, the energy came from the solution those reacting species A and B were in. So the energy grabbed from the solution, and since the energy grabbed for, uh, from the solution, the temperature of the solution went down. So it's actually going to be an endothermic process. Okay, another example of an endothermic process would be a solid going to the liquid. Remember the ice, if it's sitting uh, sitting on the table, is not going to melt by itself unless it's gaining the energy from the uh, from the surroundings, and that's an endothermic process. And uh, similarly, if I write down the opposite of that, the liquid going back to the solid is going to be an exothermic process because it releases energy. So if one way, going one way is exothermic, coming back is going to be endothermic so that just goes hand in hand on the other hand if there is no change in temperature and it does happen sometimes if you mix up two solution nothing happens in terms of the temperature and if nothing happens it's neither exothermic or endothermic all right so not exothermic or endothermic or endothermic rather Okay, so they are, the temperature and the energy are obviously two different things, but uh, you can relate those uh, one another by looking at if the energy is being released, and if that's the case, the temperature is going to go up, and if the energy is required, the temperatures of the surroundings will go down. So let's uh, look at a term that actually relates the temperature and the energy with one another, and that's called an a specific heat capacity. So the definition of an specific heat capacity is going to be the energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of an object by one degree Celsius. Okay, and um, let me write down the equation for it. So if the specific heat capacity has a symbol C, it's going to be equal to the energy required. So the energy in this particular case is going to be Q. So remember the energy or the heat is the, has a symbol Q. And uh, this should have been delta T right there. And then uh, divided by the energy required to change the temperature of one gram of object. So divided by the mass, which has a symbol M, times the delta T, which is going to be the change in temperature. So all those symbols or I have those written down on the left here. So C is the specific heat capacity. Q is the just the heat or the energy. Delta T is going to be the change in temperature. And change in temperature is always going to be the temperature final minus the temperature initial. So uh, that's the formula you're going to be using to calculate the change in temperature. M is going to be for the mass. So that's the equation or that's the definition of the specific heat capacity. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to kind of memorize that particular formula, but if I do rearrange this, it becomes Q equals M, M C delta T. Okay, and uh, it's rather easier to memorize this particular form because you can just call it Q equals M cat. Everything else still stays the same: um, mass, specific heat capacity, change in the temperature. Uh, the specific heat capacity is actually a constant number for a particular metal or an object. For example, the specific heat capacity for water, so C for water is going to be 1.00 grams over, uh, sorry, 1.00 calories 
over grams degrees Celsius. So calories is one of the units uh, used for the energy. And if I want to express the same specific heat capacity in terms of joules, that would have been 4.184 joules over grams degrees Celsius. Because remember, one calorie within a lowercase c is equal to 4.184 joules. Um, this is something you want to be aware of because it's just water and you have to know quite a bit things about the water when you take in a chemistry or physics course. Okay, so what that really means, if I want to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius, it will require one calories of energy. And uh, it may sound a fairly small number for the energy, but think about it, it's only one gram of water. So one gram of water is literally one milliliters of water. So that's technically a good uh, amount of energy for one milliliters of water. So water does act as a buffer system inside the human body as it resists the change in the temperature of the human body uh, because the 70% of the body weight in, in, in the human bodies or even in the living organisms is actually water. So if you have to raise the temperature of uh, the human body by one degree Celsius, you got to make sure you heat up all those water molecules and that would require a lot of energy. So it's in a buffer system. It's in a buffer system for the environment as well because we do have a lot of vapors or moisture in the air. Obviously, the moisture does not have the same value for the specific heat capacity, but having so, uh, such a big amount of uh, moisture, it acts as a buffer in the, in, the, in the atmosphere as well. And as a result, the temperature of the atmosphere doesn't change very quickly. It does require a lot of energy. Okay, so how do you really use this in the, in the problems? So you have a few variables there. You got specific heat capacity, the heat, um, the mass, and the temperature. So think of four variables. A lot of times you will be given three out of the four, and you will be asked to calculate the unknown. Okay, so it's all about figuring out what's given to you and manipulating this equation in order to figure out the unknown. So let's look at uh, this first question here. So I got calculate the energy required to raise the temperature of one grams of water, sorry, 10 grams of water from 20 degrees Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius. Okay, so seems like I got the mass of the water. So I'll just go and write that down here. That's going to be the mass. And I got the temperatures here. So this 20 degrees is the starting temperature and 60 degrees is the final temperature. So Ti and T final are actually given. All right, so I got the mass to be 10.0 grams and I got the delta T here, the change in temperature would be T final minus T initial and that's gonna be 60 minus 20. Okay, so that's gonna be 40 degrees Celsius the specific heat capacity, since it's water, the specific heat capacity is going to be 1.00 calories over grams degrees Celsius. And if you're trying to figure that out in joules, so then in that case, you want to use 4.184 joules over grams degrees Celsius. So it all really depends on what uh, units for the energy you want at the end of the day. So it seems like uh, we got everything here. So if I use the equation Q equals MC delta T, so the mass is going to be 10.0 grams times the temperature is 40 degrees Celsius, and then the specific heat capacity is 1.0 calories over grams degrees Celsius. So when you do set it up like that, uh, the grams cancels out and then we have the degree Celsius that cancels out as well and at the end of the day you have the calories left over so it's going to be calories here and when you do this math it's going to be 10 times 40 which is going to be 400 calories of energy would be required to raise the temperature of 10 grams of water by 40 degrees Celsius okay so that's one of them Let's try another one, so where we have a different uh, unknown here. 
So the question reads, calculate the specific heat capacity. So now we're trying to figure out the specific heat capacity of an unknown metal. All right, so we got some unknown metal. So it's a CM is what we're trying to figure out here. If 350 joules of energy is released. Okay, so, well, you know, in the previous question, I didn't really mention it, but let's just kind of go back and briefly mention it. The question, previous question said energy required, so that would have been an endothermic process. And think about it, when you have to warm up the water, what do you have to do? You have to actually supply some energy to warm up the water, so that's an endothermic process. On the other hand, here, the energy is released, all right? So 350 joules of energy is released, so that's actually gonna be an exothermic process. And anytime the energy is released, uh, um, the Q by sign convention is easily taken as negative, which literally means you are losing energy there. And uh, even if you don't take it, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna make a big difference in the calculations. All right, you may see a, a negative sign or in, in the answer option, but it is, just doesn't really mean anything else besides just uh, uh, knowing that the energy is released here. And the delta T is going to be the T final minus T initial. And we are going from 80 degrees Celsius, which is going to be your T initial, to 40 degrees Celsius, which is going to be your T final. Okay, so that's going to be 40 minus 80, and that's going to be negative 40 degrees Celsius. So remember I said earlier that you use the energy to be negative whenever you're releasing, and it's only by sign convention because remember you got a negative sign for the energy here, and you got a negative sign for the delta T here so that they can cancel out one another, and that's the whole purpose of using these uh, signs here. And the mass of the metal is given to be 50.0 grams, okay? So if I wanna go ahead and use that equation, which is Q equals MC delta T. So we know the Q, we know the M, and we know the delta T, and we need to figure out the C there. So if I rearrange this, then it's gonna be C equals Q over M times delta T. And you can do your math however you want. You can go ahead and plug it in the numbers and uh, um, figure out what the C is going to be. Or you can just have C on one side and take everything else on the other side because C is the unknown here. So your Q is going to be negative 350 joules divided by the mass is 50.0 grams. And then the delta T is going to be negative 40 degrees Celsius. Okay, so the negative signs will cancel out. And uh, when you do this math here, so you got 350 you got 350 times, well, 350 divided by 50 times 40. So that comes out to be 0.175. 0.175 joules over grams degree Celsius as the specific heat capacity for this metal. Okay, so if I go back and just double check, it uh, seems like yeah, the maximum number of sig figs you have in here is actually two because 350 has three, two sig figs, 80 and 40 also have two sig figs. And um, to just kind of keep uh, track of those, uh, this answer could also be written as 0.18 joules over grams degree Celsius if you are worrying about uh, the sig figs in there. All right, so hopefully these, this session was helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to leave any comments in the section below.